Blair is a lost township, tucked away in the trees, just a stone's throw from the road between Allapool and Inverness at Inverlaw. Centuries of history lie buried and forgotten. In this series, with the help of Allapool Museum, archaeologists and historical experts, we're bringing the people and stories of Bal Blair and Inverlaw back to life. Eight snapshots reimagined moments in Highland history which have, until recently, been hidden in plain sight. Episode 5 The Reverend Thomas Ross. Hi, good night to you, Mr. McRae. Good night, Kenneth Bain. So all I get is silence from you. So be it. Yet still I say good night, and may the Lord guide you. O thou that in the heavens dost dwell, mark, O Lord, what I have to thole. A man blameless and upright, who fears God and turneth away from evil. Tis I, Lord, humble Thomas Ross, a pillar of thy temple. I stand alone before you, deserted by laird and commoner alike. Anyway, for the moment, the trust's aim is to keep the building intact, so that's what we're doing at the moment. We've re-roofed it. Lord, do you speak to me? We've recently been putting in new lintels. Seem to hear voices. Huge, great old ship's timbers in the lintels, and they were strange. ruinous. So they've all been taken out and replaced. I strive to comprehend. And the joists are, are of the gallery floor, they were all rotten where they went in the wall. Yeah. So that's all been redone. And if I close my eyes, I see sights. The present sort of worry is that we had uh, to take a window out. Yeah, I wonder what that was. That was a bit early in the, in the, in the planning. Equally mystifying. My church, yet transformed. When the lintel came out, it wasn't possible to keep the window, and it wasn't possible to refurbish the window either. So it's having to be remade. When was uh, it built? Uh, 17, 1817. Yeah. Or is it Lucifer, the great deceiver I hear? Who is it that stands in judgment before me? I'm Siobhan Beetson. I am the curator at Alto Museum. I am part leading the research team for the Lost Envelope project. Dr Thomas Ross is the minister at Lochran Parish Church, which we would refer to as Clacken. More, more voices, disembodied, queer and distant. Do they emanate from the New Jerusalem or the Inferno? At the time of the clearance, he would have been the minister that would have served the people who have been cleared from Envelope. The people from there would be known to him and he would know them personally and intimately. I would not be elected to see the wretched morning that only too soon will dawn, but not before a long, dark night. I and of money a soul. I'm Cathy Dagg. I am an archaeologist and heritage consultant and came to look at Thomas Ross through looking at the archaeology of the area of Clacken and realising that he had made his mark there on the built heritage. Or perhaps it's my own conscience that torments me. Lord, help me to understand. I like putting a face to the archaeology. You know, the archaeology is all about buildings, but when you can actually bring a person to life who inhabited those buildings, then it makes the whole archaeological story just come to life. Have I not served thee faithfully all these years upon this spiritually perilous rock and loch I have laboured to build thy church? And now, what is to become what? He was the minister of Loch Broom, which is a massive parish. He didn't actually come up here and take up the ministry until I think he was already in his 40s. He's an interesting man. I think this idea of Thomas Ross being a baddie has been quite popular and has passed itself down through the generations. But the reasons to that have become a little bit intangible. We have left undone 
those things which we ought to have done and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. There is no health in us. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. I, for one, have only ever served your purpose. Let my flock and obeyed the rule of this world and the next. He was a social climber to a certain extent. His father was nothing more than a farm grieve. And I know that's not bottom of the social class, but it's not really where you would expect to find somebody who then goes to a university and gets a degree and learns Latin and Greek. But he obviously had a natural affinity for languages and you know, he was a fluent Gaelic speaker. Agus Mavin as Viechen. A veil, Marava Hesinia, Darluch, Fiech. Agus the leak, Alnum Utak Sheen, Axur Sheen, O Ork. And forgive us our debts, just as we forgive our debtors, and don't leave us in temptation, but free us from wickedness. Even though these ministers are serving Gaelic speaking communities, the ratio of ministers who start speaking Gaelic or start allowing Gaelic elements into the sermon and the service is quite small. Thomas Ross does seem to be translating certain scriptures into Gaelic and is advertising them for sale within the newspapers. Mundus sum ego absque delicto abaculatus et non est iniquitas in me, and its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth in every way, Lord. I have tried to learn and serve. And I think scholarliness is what probably came most naturally to him. And if he'd not had to earn a living, I'm sure he would have been absolutely happy just somewhere in a room with his books, undisturbed. He did like to keep on top of his parishioners. You know, the parishioners were his income. He had a very basic income from the stipend and from what he could make on the glebe, but everything else was pretty much persuading his parishioners to come to him to do the births, the marriages, the funerals, everything like that. <sighs> Am I to be accused on all sides? Bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. People, uh, they would come here in order to get the licenses and, and read the bans for their marriage, even if they went to the parliamentary church that had started yeah. in Liverpool in the 20s. And, um, and that was thought to be a real nuisance and a bit of an abuse of his position. And he got into quite a fight when there was a suggestion that part of his parish would be hived off and he would lose that money. And I don't think it's that he was bothered about losing the souls. He, what he concerned him was that he would no longer get the revenue for himself from all the parishioners that he would lose. And he was living an expensive lifestyle. He was Helen Damnation Fire and Brimstone. He was there to maintain the status quo. There was no lifting anybody up out of poverty. There was no sort of helping people to become educated, to get a better life, anything like that. The earthly order reflects the heavenly. The proprietors must shoulder the burthen of their God-given land, just as the king himself endures for the kingdom, and the king of kings for the greater kingdom beyond. There are stories, and one of those stories is that he acted as some sort of agent between George Stuart Mackenzie of Cool, who was the landowner who triggered the clearance of the area, and that Thomas Ross worked on behalf of him to assist in clearing the people of the area. This is a popular story that has passed down, so I would assume that there potentially is an element of truth in there, but what his actual role within that is, we don't have any written document to say that there's any. It is not for a minister, the shepherd, to change that which has been decreed. And have I not suffered myself at the hands of our landlord? My people are not learned. They're here to toil, not to question. Too many of the old ways to which the lower orders feel unworthy attachment are injurious to their own physical and spiritual health. God's judgment must be accepted with patience, mine own not excluded. George Stewart just looked upon these people as n not much better than animals. And Thomas Ross had to collude with that. When you think of a minister nowadays, they fight against 
social injustices, well, absolutely no way was he going to rock the boat. You know, he was up there with the landowners, making sure that people knew their place and did as they were told. The facts of what happened are that some of the families that were evicted from over the water came across and took up temporary residence on the glebe. The glebe being the, the church land that Thomas Ross had the use of. Lord, spirits, why dost thou plague me with accusations? In all labour there is profit, but the talk of the lips tendeth only to penury. The crown of the wise is the riches, but the foolishness of fools is folly. I do only as I am guided by the word. How do I defend myself in this court of ghosts and bogles and disembodied cognac? The glebe lands for Clacken Church are actually some of the largest glebe lands associated with the church in Scotland, but most of it is really rubbish land. So you've got the church, you've got the really good farmland just beside it, and then you've got this huge area of absolutely rubbish hill that's no use for anything. Really, really steep. And the people actually found a little temporary toehold on this steep hillside. No grazing for the cattle, nothing to live in, and yet they were there long enough to actually build houses and build enclosures. So that suggests not just a few months, maybe a couple of years, and they have minuscule crofts, so they have become Thomas Ross's tenants. So whatever his attitude was to these people coming over the water with all their livestock, their children, their baggage, it would be nice to think that he was being benevolent like that. But you can't help but also think that what he gave was rubbish, and he could have given better, and he could have given sooner. And when he did give, he didn't give, he gave tenancies so that he was going to get an income and that sort of links in with his sort of slightly financial minded sort of attitudes. I am a simple pastor of souls, not lives. How am I to live, to preach the Lord's words if I fall into penury myself? Lighten my darkness, I beseech thee, O Lord, and by thy great mercy defend me from all perils and dangers of this night. For in the morn this church shall be without parish. In the morn a new exodus I have conferred twixt laird and tenant and between this veil of tears and the kingdom to come to the best of the talents thou hast given me. I think he is quite a conflicted person. I don't think he's a very two-dimensional character. I think he is a person who has a lot of flaws but would potentially also have aspects of empathy for his parishioners who he sees having trouble and has an element of understanding as it turns out that he himself has had a very similar experience as to these people. Oh Lord, correct me, but with judgement, not in anger lest thou bring me to nothing and let this damned jury be done with me. When dawn rises, I shall execute in good faith what I understand to be required of me, nothing more, no less, and without thought for myself. I do not wash my hands before the multitude. I am innocent of the fate that befall my flock. I'm not entirely sure whether Ross has been treated fairly or not. I would err on the side of he hasn't but I think just because he has had life experience he has had situations that we could empathise with them on doesn't necessarily make somebody a nice person the church that still stands today has served the community for 200 years even though it's not a functioning church anymore weddings are still being practised in it even in the summer of 2022 descendants from the people cleared at Inverlaw are getting married in this church to continue its legacy. O Lord, thou that in the heavens dost well look down with pity, I pray to you, guide me. In Hidden in Plain Sight, the experts were Siobhan Beetson, Kathy Dagg and Peter Newling. The writer was Chris Dolan and the actor Mark Stephen. 
Hidden in Plain Sight was produced by Adventurous Audio Limited and made possible thanks to the support of the Audio Content Fund. <laughs>